One of the biggest downers of the modern era is that we're never going to get to see a living dinosaur. But until somebody pulls the Jurassic Park, the next best thing we have is Prehistoric Planet. The series first debuted on Apple TV Plus last year, and it received incredible reviews from across the globe. So it wasn't that surprising when they announced that they got the green light to go ahead for a second series. Well, it's arrived, and we of course wanted to find out about the new dinosaurs we can expect, the stories that are going to unfold, and the incredible science that underpins all of it. So, I'm here at MPC in London to speak to executive producer Mike Gunton and series producer Tim Walker to find out what we can expect from Prehistoric Planet 2. So, fantastic Mike and Tim, it's great to see you again and congratulations on the second series. Thank you very much. So one of the first things I noticed on the Apple TV post that we got sent, the uh, hero image of a swimming T-Rex, that's now a motorcycle hunting. So do you think they're the stars of this series? They are one of the stars, definitely. I think it makes a great poster because it's so dynamic and it's a double take because when you first see it, you think, what is that? And then you think, oh my God, it's got a, dino well, it's got a marine reptile in its jaws. Then you realise how enormous that must be. So yeah, I think it's a good, I think it's a good image, a good icon. I think also as well, it speaks of the variety that, that the series brings. So it's not just about dinosaurs. This is prehistoric planet. It's a massively diverse world that had loads of other animals living alongside the dinosaurs. And seeing the mosasaur leaping out with the lasmosaur in its mouth, you know, is indicative of the fact that we're going to tell stories about a huge cast of characters, not just T-Rex and Triceratops. Obviously, they're in it, mm. but this time we. But we brought more to the screen than we did in series one. And also, one of the episodes it mentions that you actually commissioned some research about the acceleration power of mosasaurs. So, what did that find? Well, the, the, the biology of that animal, they, we believe, is that it's an ambush predator. And like a lot of the type of creatures, they think what well, it would have to accelerate incredibly quickly and then smash into the animal, and that would be the, the killing blow rather than actually biting it. But how can an animal that size generate that amount of thrust, that amount of power? Um, we know we, we believed it would do this thing where it called a sea star, where it bends its body around and then, then fixes it very fast, but could it actually generate that amount of thrust? No one knew. So some very clever people did some extraordinarily complex calculations, and they ran four different models and realised that it was not only had it got the power to that, but it also had the power to actually leap, effectively breach still out of the, clear out of water. You know, I think this is, again... Uh, something about the series is that we have been working with a massive team of paleontologists. We've got uh, lead scientific consultant Dr. Darren Nash, who's embedded in the team. He's got his finger on the paleontological pulse, so to speak. So we're speaking to people all over the world that are, that are doing research all the time. And throughout the production, we've incorporated new science as it's come to light, sometimes before it's been published, but it's informed some of the decisions that we've made in the series to portray different aspects of behaviour. And then we see it, you know, several years later, the work gets published, our predictions have, have come to light. And it, it, it puts us in this golden age of dinosaur interpretation. Fantastic. So you've got new insights, and there's also some new faces for this series. So I was wondering if you could talk about some of the new dinosaurs we can expect. Yeah, we've, we've, we've set the second series in the same time period as the first series. Um, part of the reason is because it has got a cast of characters that are very familiar. It has got T-Rex and Triceratops. But we brought new dinosaurs and new additional characters in. So we've got marine reptiles, we've got pterosaurs in the air, but we've got this wealth of new dinosaurs. So there's about 15 or 16 brand new dinosaurs. Um, one of my favourites is the Isosaurus, which we see in the Badlands episode, they're really cool. We've also got some brand new sauropods, so the large long necked dinosaurs. They're peppered across the series, they feature in most of the episodes, uh, and they're going to show bits of behaviour that people have never seen before. I thought you were going to talk about your favourite, which is Pachycephalosaur. I mean, it's not, a, it's not a new dinosaur in terms of a discovery, but it's new to our series, and the behaviour we've shown, I think, um, one of the things when you, when you try and tell these stories, of course, you want to, you want to touch some of the expected behaviour because people, you know, it's got this wonderful dome head, looks like a sort of like a dragon. So you expect it to have, uh, to do this kind of ritualistic um, combat. But as well as that, it also does display. So, you know, the, one of the things that's so fantastic about nature is when you want weird stuff to happen, it's always, always about sex. 
And of course, this is almost certainly a, a sexual display. The males had these, almost certainly had these uh, surfaces to be able to flush blood or something to give coloration, which would have been both an, an inter a male male combat, a male male um, sort of communication, but also probably attracting females as well. So the, the, there's a couple of other characters as well that I think will surprise people that aren't dinosaurs. So we've got a mammal, which has a, a lead uh, storyline, which is amazing. You know, it's about the size of a badger. People thought that that you know many people think that that mammals weren't around at the same time as dinosaurs, but they were. They were just mostly small things. Uh, we've got an amazing crocodilomorph, so a, a relative of crocodiles, which is about the size of a small dog, and it lives on land mainly, and it's vegetarian. <laughs> it does some really cool burrowing behaviour. So I think these surprises will paint this really lovely picture of a prehistoric bat. Yeah, that burrowing one, it was kind of wombat-like with the uh, reverse direction attack technique. I love that. Um, Mike, you brought up sex, and I did want to ask, because <laughs> <laughs> there is a sequence between some triceratops, and it got me thinking, like, you know, how do we inform our ideas of actually how these dinosaurs mated? Well, I think one of the, one of the sort of premises that we, we adopt is using contemporary biology. The, the rules of biology, we, and we know a lot about how sexual selection works, so you can sort of back construct some of these things. So, so I, I think the story that I think de probably de demonstrates it best, you, you know the, the two um, giant pterosaurs, the two Hatsocopteryx courtship sequence? I love that because all the rules of sexual dimorphism, case selection about having, you know, the females only have a small number of eggs so they've got to make a big investment so they've got to pick the right male, all the things about the male demonstrating his fitness by an I love these quaint expressions, nuptial gift, when it gives them, offers the female this dinosaur that it's collected to show it's a good, it's a good prospect. And using all those rules from what we know about how the rules of contemporary biology and back fitting those to, to the fossil evidence gives such a fantastic, authentic story. Now, of course, the other thing, of course, the lovely ritualised courtship, because you've got two very, very dangerous animals, a male and a female, you want to make sure you're not giving them the wrong signals, so you do this long, this escalation of courtship. So, so that that's the sort of things that I think we can be very confident that that's what they would have done. Actual mating, the act of mating, that's much much harder to know. In fact, probably pretty fleeting as well. So we can kind of move on to that. <laughs> but I mean, we do show. Uh, yeah, you know, very mating discreet. occur a couple of yeah. times in, in Triceratops, we'll see it in Hatsocopteryx as well and uh, people have spent a lot of time discussing the actual biomechanics of two large animals, how they would get together and, and there's only certain positions that animals of that size yeah. with, with that body type could achieve. So. I mean, funny, there's, it's quite funny, John Favreau, who works with us, it says, always likes the fact that we cut away to, the, <laughs> to a bit of a wave crashing or a leaf blowing or something like that, like the old Hollywood days where the, wind, where the, where the curtain would blow. In the, it's the, very tasteful. Very tasteful. <laughs> but uh, yeah, but that, with, the, with the triceratops, you know, the, it must have been quite a complicated and tricky lock and key position, I suspect. Interesting. Mm. And then on the other side of things, we have a fantastic cast of baby animals mm. in this series. Yeah. I wondered if you guys could tell me your favourites. I think that I've got two favourite babies. Uh, the baby velociraptors are phenomenally cute. You know, they'll probably give you a nasty nip, but they look marvellous. And the baby ammonites, so not a dinosaur, but the baby ammonites uh, are wonderful. They're full of character, despite I mean, being tiny, they've got a wonderful storyline as well, but the depiction of them, I think, is, is so engaging that you, you want to watch them. I think the baby isosaurs that are the, that are the subject of being attacked by the rajasaurs, um, we, we actually call them podlets, because, you know, but the story of those, the fact that you know, the eggs can only, dinosaurs can only reach a certain size, so every baby dinosaur can only be a, not much bigger than this, yet it's going to grow into this absolute giant. And um, seeing them emerge, and then this epic journey to escape across these, these, um, these uh, fumarole fields. I, I, I just love that story. Interesting thing, they were quite tricky to... The animation of that was really interesting because 
The biomechanics of how they walk is quite difficult to model, and it took a lot of getting right, But because they have a slightly sort of, almost like a little clockwork look about them. But, um, no, I think they're cute. <laughs> uh, speaking of the difficulties of modelling animals based on fossils and things like that, one of the specimens I was most amazed by is the paperclip-shaped ammonite. Mm -hmm. um, I've seen pictures of fossils of those, and even still, with the shape lined out, it seems so hard to imagine what it would look like swimming through the water. So was that one of the more difficult ones to work with the animators <coughs> on? Were that more difficult ones than that? Ammonites were tricky, weren't they? they were actually, ammonites were one of the hardest things. If you ask our animators, which, is their, which was their nightmare, it was ammonites, because there's something about the... The, the, the way the shells behave in the, in the fluid, but also how the... Because, of course, they don't... Everybody thinks it's their, their tentacles. They're not. They have a little jet, which they jet, and they can use the mantle to accelerate. Quite complicated. And when you get something like that, paper, the paperclip one, as you call it, as rightly, um, I mean, it must have been an extraordinarily difficult thing to... But if you go to a museum and see these things, they, are, they, they have the most bizarre... Shapes, absolutely incredible. When we were designing uh, some of the ammonites, there's quite a few ammonites in, in the series. Um, of course, on the whole, soft body parts don't preserve in the fossil record, and, and we had to do quite a lot of design work with some specialists to work out how we thought the, the soft parts of the ammonites would appear outside of their shell. So what we're seeing in prehistoric planet is, in some cases, never been seen before. Also, we had to be. We had a very um, one particular expert eye on that because, of course, David Attenborough is a lover, of, a great fan, and very knowledgeable about ammonites. So he scrutinised our reconstructions very, very carefully. As a, a top tier consultant. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> well, we don't want to give too much away, but uh, so we'll leave it there. So thank you so much. Um, I can imagine that the paleo artists are going to have a whale of time with this one, mm. and it was great to speak to you both. Thank you very thank much. Thank you very much. Lovely. So, from dinosaurs we'd never seen on screen before, to a frog with the bite power of a tiger, and an ammonite that looks a bit like a paperclip, it's safe to say there's quite a lot you don't want to miss from Prehistoric Planet 2. The five-day watch party begins on May 22nd on Apple TV+, and you can keep up with all of the dinosaur debate on their brand new podcast. So, happy viewing!